So in a deeply religious culture that's accumulated more mantras and prayers than anyone could ever enumerate, perhaps the best known of all is a short verse in seven lines addressed to Padmasambhava, who is the legendary 8th century conversion hero and founder of Tibetan Buddhism. Its current phrasing was probably codified around the 13th century by Guru Chowang, a famous devotee of Padmasambhava, but we find fragments of an earlier version in the 10th century documents from Dunhuang that Brandon has just mentioned. And uh, the opening line of this prayer is very pertinent to our symposium because it announces that Padmasambhava came to Tibet from the northwest borders of the land of Wudhyana. Now, as the object of uh, so much devotion for so long, Padmasambhava inevitably became hugely mythologized, and even the most basic narratives of his life story soon diverged from knowable history. So some scholars have doubted his historicity, but I think the majority accept that behind the myths was a real historical figure and that he came from Udiana. So since, uh, since Tucci and his extraordinary scholarship, I think most scholars have agreed that ancient Udiana was centered on the modern day Swat Valley of Pakistan. Ah, ah okay. Swat is a long river valley at the western end of the Himalayas in the foothills of the Hindu Kush Karakoram Ranges, and its average altitude is 3,000 feet, but it's encircled by mountains of up to 18,000 feet. More recently, scholars have envisaged a broader definition of Udiana, which includes Gilgit to the northeast, and in that case, the old prayer might indicate Gilgit as Padmasambhava's birthplace. I think you can see Gilgit on the map there. As the crow flies, Swat is only a few hundred miles from the Tibetophone world, and Gilgit's dramatic mountain scenery directly adjoins Baltistan, where a dialect of Tibetan is still spoken. So Padmasambhava was either a native of Swat, where Tibetan and Indian Buddhist civilizations had already met and traded for hundreds of years, or he was a native of Gilgit, an immediate neighbor of Tibet. But historically, Udiana had been much more. It was also a geographical and cultural crossroads where over many centuries, Central Asians, Persians, and Greeks had also left deep imprints. Its rich heritage of Buddhist artifacts have captivated generations of archeologists and art historians. Most famously, the Greek-influenced Buddha statues that began to be produced in the region after the first century of the Common Era. Udiana was a truly major center for Buddhism. It was so renowned that Buddhist pilgrimage from China and Tibet continued long after its actual Buddhist institutions had collapsed. In earlier centuries, Udiana and the Gandhara region as a whole had been key centers for the development and propagation of Mahayana Buddhism, where it was richly patronized by the Kushan dynasty. They had originated in Central Asia, but extended their dominions across the northwestern parts of the Indian subcontinent as well. It was from their territories that Buddhism spread through Central Asia to China. Mahayana Buddhists everywhere still remember the Kushan Emperor Kanishka as a mighty patron who organized a historic religious council and built a fabulous stupa. And all this is still recorded in traditional Tibetan learning. But by Padmasambhava's time of the late eighth century, Odiana's Mahayana tradition had long ago declined, and in its place had emerged Tantric Buddhism, shortly to be followed by a remarkable and closely interconnected local school of philosophically non-dual Shaivism that actually took Buddhist philosophy as its starting point. So just as Odiana had been a great Mahayana center from the first through fifth centuries, following the fifth and sixth centuries, it had developed into an equally great center of Tantric religion, both Buddhist and Shaiva. And contemporary scholars like Deborah Klimberg Salter, Anna Filigenzi, and Luca Maria Olivieri are now increasingly making discoveries about this later tantric phase of Udiana's art and archaeology. Padmasambhava's charismatic appeal was clearly enhanced by the singular mystique of his homeland. So much so that his great 13th century devotee, Guru Chowang, 
simply refers to Padmasambhava as Urjan, which is the Tibetan pronunciation of Uddiyana. And innumerable, innumerable other Tibetans have done, have done the same. So while Ugyen could be taken as short for Ugyen Rinpoche, meaning the precious guru from Uddiyana, or Ugyen Pema, meaning Padmasambhava from Uddiyana, it's still rather as though Western devotees of the Dalai Lama were, in a spirit of great respect, simply to call him Tibet. Ugyen remains a popular personal name in Tibet. And we also seem to see the Odiana Association represented iconographically. Anna Filigenzi suggests Padmasambhava's distinctive visual represent representation is modeled on an 8th century Odiana iconography of the Siddha or realized tantric practitioner. Padmasambhava's popularity with Tibetans can only have been helped by his native affinity with highland cultures and long standing experience of Tibetan civilization. Piligenzi talks of a vital, polycentric cultural world stretching across the Hindu Kush, Karakoram, Himalaya region, of which in the 8th century, both Uddiyana and much of Tibet would have been part. At that time, Uddiyana lay in the shadow of the powerful Tibetan Empire's expansions into Central Asia. As Deborah Klimberg Salter points out, from the 7th century, parts of northern Pakistan constituted the western borderland of the Tibetan Empire. There can be little doubt that an educated, interested native of 8th century Odiana, whether from Gilgit or Swat, would be acutely aware of Tibet, its empire, and its culture. And ancient documents do seem to indicate a high degree of cultural understanding contributing to Padmasambhava's remarkable capture of the Tibetan imagination. The three earliest extant manuscripts to describe Padmasambhava come from Dunhuang. Two are inscribed in the 10th and one in the early 11th centuries, but we, we suspect all are copies of older texts, and in one case we can prove it's copy of an older text. Although written at different times and in different hands, each of them portrays Padmasambhava incorporating indigenous Himalayan deities, symbols, and ritual structures into tantric Buddhism. These remarkable old manuscripts seem to bear witness to a deliberate policy of Padmasambhava's or of his early schools to assimilate Indian Buddhism to Tibetan culture. They offer us direct contemporaneous windows onto the early stages of a long process that over the next three centuries was to issue into a distinctively Tibetan form of Vajrayana, focused on Padmasambhava as its founding guru and exhibiting a significant degree of hybridity in iconography, narrative, and ritual grammar. Nowadays, we call this the Nimapa, or the ancient school of Tibetan Buddhism. So let's look at these three Dunhuang sources in turn. The first text is known by its Bibliothèque Nationale de France cap uh, catalogue number, Peliot Tibetan 307, or PT 307 for short. It's a narrative text for use in ritual, describing Padmasambhava taming a group of indigenous goddesses and converting them into protectors of Buddhism, in this way inducting them into the tantric Buddhist pantheon. All but one of the goddesses' names in PT 307 are clearly recognizable to modern Tibetans as those used for a set nowadays known as the Tenma Chunyi, or the 12 established goddesses. These 12 remain important, notably as protectors of Tibet's borders. Nimopas in particular propitiate them in daily protector rites and they also give them a very special niche within their tantric feast offerings in the protector sections of that. They are propitiated by the other schools too, and the failure of the, gov of the Tibetan government adequately to perform their rites through the 1940s is sometimes said to have been a factor in permitting the Chinese communists to invade Tibet. PT 307 describes Padmasambhava and his disciple Lang Palgisenge taming these Tibetan goddesses through binding them by oath whilst gratifying them with remainder offerings. And to this day, the very same narrative appears in rituals. A particular offering to the 12 established goddesses must be made near the end of every Nima tantric feast offering, immediately following the general offering of remainders to the protectors. But before their particular offering can be made, a reminder must be narrated of the original covenant they made with Padmasambhava and Lang Senge back in the 8th century which was the original precedent for the rite. 
Only after this rehearsal can the 12 established goddesses receive their offerings. And I find it fascinating how Lang Palgi Senge still continues to figure as Padmasambhava's assistant in these ritual narratives, along with other details from PT 307. And you won't find Lang Palgi Senge any, anywhere else. He's just in these tenma offerings. So this illustrates another really interesting feature of PT 307. It's not actually structured like an Indian Buddhist text at all. Rather, it follows a ubiquitous pre-Buddhist ritual narrative template called a rub or mang. Previous Tibetologists have written a great deal about the rub, notably uh, Samton Kame and uh, before him Rolf Stein. So I won't go into great detail here, except to say it is understood as one of the most distinctive signatures of pre-Buddhist Tibetan ritual. It entails a very particular way of integrating myth with ritual by narrating an original precedent for a rite, naming the legendary officiants who first did the rite and the exact reasons and circumstances in which they did it. In this way, subsequent performers can know how and why the rite will be appropriate and effective for them. The indigenous rub format has been accepted into Nima Buddhism. It often occurs embedded within Indian-style tantric rituals. For example, it's intrinsic to regular feast and protector offerings I've just described. A longer extended form of rub can also be recited to introduce tantric initiations or in ped pedagogical contexts such as the opening teachings for a long retreat. The second of the three oldest documents to describe Padmasambhava, PT44, is also a rub, and like PT307, continues to be widely used in Nemo narrative and ritual. It describes Padmasambhava at the Asura cave in Yanglesho in Nepal, subduing a set of four dangerous goddesses native to the Himalayan foothills. Once they are subdued, Padmasambhava procures a complete set of the Vajrakilaya Tantras from Nalanda Monastery in India. He comprehensively redacts these tantras, integrating the four goddesses he has just tamed into their mandalas as protectors. He then teaches Vajrakilaya to a few highly accomplished disciples at various locations along Tibet's southern borders. And as though to confirm this narrative, an old Vajrakilaya tantra, the Purba Chunyi, which I think is also mentioned by name in Dunhuang, and produced perhaps within the early school of Padmasambhava in Tibet, it actually includes a section on the four goddesses Padmasambhava tamed at Yanglisho alongside other unashamedly indigenous ritual categories. Ah. There we are. A striking syncretic element in PT 44 is the manner in which Padmasambhava handles the dangerous goddesses. He confines them within his hat, where they become docile. <laughs> this is not what Buddhists normally do in Indian sources, because in their symbolism, it is more customary for the guru to be placed on the head, while unruly or subservient elements like these goddesses should more usually be placed at the feet or on the limbs. And maybe that's why this detail does not occur in later versions of the narrative and survives only within the old Dunhuang text. Yet we know from the triangulations of different historical and ethnological sources that it was the quintessential practice of pre-Buddhist shamans across much of the Himalayas and Tibet to place protective deities symbolized by feathers on their headdresses. As uh, Tony Huber and others have pointed out, wearing a magical feathered headgear to represent their protective deities remains ubiquitous amongst the scattered surviving communities of Himalayan and Tibetan shamans across a vast geographical range, arguably constituting their most distinctive insignia. It's also a tradition of great antiquity, found in Tang descriptions of Tibetan royal priests wearing bird hats, in ancient Tibetan legends, such as those of the Shangshung kings with their feathered crowns, in non-Buddhist Dunhuang texts describing bird or vulture feathers placed ritually on the head, and also witnessing surviving early documents such as the remarkable Mokotov manuscript. And as we can see, rather uniquely in Buddhist iconography, Padmasambhava has vulture feathers in his hat. I don't know of any other siddha from, from an Indian tradition that has vulture feathers in his hat like that. And Huber has suggested entirely plausibly that this is a reference to indigenous religious iconography.
The third Dunhuang Padmasambhava manuscript is an excellently well-preserved tantric commentary on the Noble Noose of Methods Tantra, complete in 85 folios, with a scriptural root text embedded as lemata. It informs us at three different points that Padmasambhava produced it, although emphasizing he does so out of his spiritual accomplishment as a siddha, not through ordinary egotistical fabrication. It clarifies further that whatever is spoken out of a mind of pure awareness can be called a tantra, and, in that, and that in this sense, an accomplished siddha's tongue can produce utterances directly expressing the turning of the wheel of the Vajradharma in the Buddha field of Akanishta. Although this text at first glance appears to be composed out of familiar Indian tantric elements, there is one notable exception. It places huge wings on the central deity, which otherwise resembles a standard Indian wrathful male form known as Heruka. I searched far and wide for a winged Indian counterpart without success. I consulted a lot of leading experts, but none could locate an Indian winged Heruka, nor even one from Odiana. The closest I got was a Shaiva form called Akasha Bhairava, but my colleague, Professor Sanjukta Gupta, points out this is Himalayan Nepali, not Indian. By contrast, scholars of indigenous Himalayan religion, especially those dealing with ancient Tibet, found the wings more familiar. Tony Huber, Daniel Barunsky, Charles Ramble, and others describe a pre-Buddhist Tibetan religion often obsessed with avian imagery. A very important implement of pre-Buddhist priests and shamans accompanying their feathered headdresses was a wand made from a vulture's wing. Such wands are well attested in old sources and described in detail in a non-Buddhist Dunhuang text. They are still widely used by contemporary shamans. If the Dunhuang noble noose of methods is the earliest known attestation of the winged herica, it is by no means the last. Many or most Nima herikas still remain depicted with wings. And if one systematically compares Nima meanings and symbolisms of the wings with those of their older non-Buddhist counterparts, it seems plausible that the Buddhist herikas' wings were an ingenious and culturally sensitive accommodation to indigenous religion. There's quite a lot of detail in the Dunhuang text about how you activate the wing, how it should be made, and the Buddhist versions seem to kind of run along with that in a different Buddhist mode. It's interesting that the Sanskritic Guyagaba Tantra, so popular with the Nyamapa, does not actually mention wings anywhere. Yet even its deities are often, perhaps usually, painted with wings in Nyama art. I can't be sure if the Noble Noose of Methods was actually produced by Padma Samava as claimed, or by his early school. But either way, the attachment of wings to the Buddhist Herika seems a finely considered gesture towards indigenous iconography and in keeping with the other Dunhuang sources for Padma Samava. And if it does come from an Indian original, then it's quite an obscure Indian original, and the fact that in Tibet it was so accented is significant. As well as crossing geographical, cultural, and ritual boundaries, Padmasambha was evidently in his own time also seen to have crossed boundaries of conventions and mores. Early sources consistently associate him with a highly esoteric and transgressive form of tantrism that was still quite new and avant-garde in his lifetime. These new methods displayed Shaiva influences and had developed out of interactions between Shaivites and tantric Buddhists. They were feared as potentially dangerous by more conventional Buddhists and were not initially accepted for general dissemination by the Tibetan authorities. Evidence still survives of their official restriction within the empire in an authentic imperial text designed to guide translators and an early historical text, the Chronicles of Ba. It describes Padmasambhava being banished by the Tibetan authorities after only a short visit because of fears concerning his potential to abuse tantric powers. More interesting still, several early tantric literary sources, such as those of Nub Sangye Yeshe, or, or the early documents from Katok Monastery, give Padmasambhava no exceptional prominence whatsoever in comparison to other tantric masters. Yet as we have seen, a handful of Dunhuang sources do virtually apotheosize him as a scripture-producing, deity-taming siddha. Interpreting these conflicting accounts, 
Matthew Capstein was the first to suggest that in his own time, Padma Samova had a really powerful following only along the southern borders of Tibet, but was less welcome at the central imperial institutions. And you'll recall that PC44, that uh, Dunhuang text, describes him being active in various locations along the southern border of Tibet. However, as this particular brand of locally adapted esoteric tantrism gained popularity in subsequent decades, its growing prevalence eventually required a revision of Tibetan history to place him at the center of the imperial conversion project. Thus, he might have become, in retrospect, described as the Tibetan emperor's personal guru and as Tibet's paramount conversion hero. The Padma Samba narratives are unique in Tibetan literature through the way they straddle the boundaries of history and ritual. While no Tibetans and only few modern scholars doubt his historicity, most of the narratives that describe him indiscriminately mingle mythologies connected to tantric ritual performances with more conventional historiography. And you recall that these two Dunhong texts, PT 307 and PT 44, are in themselves ritual texts that use Padma Sambhava as a figure in ritual. To give just one example of, of uh, how he was incorporated into later Buddhist literature, there are hagiographies such as the Zanglingma or the Pema Katang, uh, they, they date from the 12th and the 14th century. They give detailed accounts of Padma Sambhava and his consort Mandarava doing longevity practices together at the Maratika cave in Nepal. Yet this narrative in the hagiographies cannot be seen separately from its parallel existence in rituals. To give just one example, in the majestic Descent of Consecration sections of the Chime Soktik Drupchen by uh, the 20th century uh, uh, Teoton, what was his name? Oh, it was written up by Dujan Rinpoche. It is not simply the case that the rituals are followed after the hagiographies. On the contrary, the relationship is symbiotic, and in many cases, ritual is generating hagiography. For example, the traditional hagiographies describe him as a young man being sent into exile from his native Odiana to live in cemeteries as a penance for his accidental killing of a youth. Yet this narrative is unmistakably descriptive of an important esoteric practice known as the Kapalika Vrata, which had originated in Shaivism and been adopted by Buddhism. So it's altogether unclear if the narrative is historic. In that sense, Padma Samhava's life stories can be seen as religious myth, even if they are presented as history. And since they are myths intended to illustrate ritual, they have little need to avoid contradiction. Hence, many of the more puzzling episodes in his biographies can only be unlocked by understanding their relation to often quite arcane elements of tantric ritual. For example, a seminal text called The Black Hundred Thousand describes two completely contradictory accounts of Padma Samhava's birth on the same folios. The first has him born conventionally from a human mother, but as a fearsomely ugly baby with the physical characteristics of the wrathful deity Vajrakilaya. The second describes him as a radiant infant born miraculously from a lotus flower on a pure lake. Both accounts are equally mythologized, the first to conform with the Vajrakilaya rituals, the second to conform with the devotional practices of Guru Yoga, and for the faithful, all are true. Metaphysically, Padma Samhava came to represent a figure within history who is simultaneously beyond history. He is both a human yogin who visited Tibet and a Buddha beyond time and space. Acting as bridge between our world and the transcendent underpins perhaps his most important role. For Padma Samhava has, for the last thousand years or so, served as the main conduit for the continuing revelation of new sacred texts in Tibet. We've already seen in the 9th or 10th century noble noose of methods tantra from Dunhuang how he is portrayed as its source. Over time, this role became greatly magnified. Tibetans believe that during the 8th century, Padma Sambhava visited every part of Tibet to bury tens of thousands of sacred texts known as terama or treasure texts. His closest disciples are then reborn again and again through time to recover the treasure texts Padma Samhava had hidden and teach them to Tibetans. And in this way, Padma Samhava became an inexhaustible source of fresh tantric scripture for generation after generation of Tibetans. Most of the liturgies used by the Nimapa and a great many of those used by other schools too are treasures of this sort. 
In addition, the tantric practice of guru yoga, or spiritual union with Padmasambhava, and the fact that this is keyed into his mythology, means that devotees are constantly reliving his life stories and merging spiritually with the guru and his retinue. Thus, Padmasambhava remains not merely a distant historical figure, but in the Tibetan imagination, a very contemporary actor as well, constantly revealing new teachings to his devotees and infusing their lives. As we've seen, the figure of Padmasambhava relates to borders in many ways. He becomes the embodiment of the enchanted border region of Odiana, where for many centuries, seminal new religious syntheses arose amidst the intermingling of different civilizations. His missionary activities creatively navigated the boundaries between Buddhist tantrism and indigenous Tibetan religion, ultimately to produce what we now call Nima Buddhism. His pioneering advocacy of esoteric Vajrayana stood in his own day at the outermost boundaries of respectability, at the same time bridging the boundaries between Buddhism and Shaivism, even if his brand of esoteric Vajrayana was later to become the mainstay of Tibetan Buddhism. His life stories and hagiographies straddle the boundaries of history and tantric ritual in a unique manner. His person comes to be seen as the bridge between this world and the next and the gateway for ongoing fresh spiritual revelations. Even his stay in Tibet might have been mainly limited to its southern borderlands, although this is no longer acknowledged by Tibetans. Unsurprisingly, his representations in art also cross his boundaries. Perhaps uniquely in the iconography of Tibetan gurus, Padmasambhava is depicted with the attributes usually reserved for kings, even though he holds only the non-royal status of a religious teacher. As Jeff Watt explains, king appearance in Himalayan art is a specific type of figurative form. The principal characteristics are the face, often with a stern look, achieved by upturned eyebrows, accompanied by a moustache and goatee. The clothing is heavy and layered with multiple colours, a cloth head covering or hat, sometimes with a small jeweled crown, and boots on the feet. They can hold any number of objects in their hands. In Tibetan art, this appearance is strictly limited to those who actually are kings. Historical kings of India or Tibet, mythical kings such as those of Shambhala, or deity kings, such as the guardian kings of the four directions. Padma Samrava is the only guru in Tibetan art who is represented in king appearance. No other saints, siddhas, gurus, or pandits of India or Tibet take this form. Well, maybe one or two, but I can't. Very, very few. It is noteworthy that Padma Samrava was already described as the lotus king in the Dunhuang text, the noble noose of methods, Tantra. I think actually King Indrabhuti, of course, is both a king and a siddha, so he would appear in king appearance. Padmasambhava's iconography surprises in other ways too. For example, he combines clothing from India with boots from Central Asia or Tibet. The many layers of his rich robes combine secular, monastic, and tantric elements. He displays emblems of Indian and Uddiyana tantrism, some familiar within Shaivism as well as in Buddhism, alongside the vulture feathers of indigenous Tibetan religion. But this is only the main iconographic form of Padma Sambhava, possibly developed, as we've seen, around an Odiana Siddhya prototype. In addition to this main form, a very popular set of eight further forms, some peaceful, some wrathful, were described by his 13th century devotee, Guru Chewang. These eight are connected to different moments in Padma Sambhava's hagiography, where he manifests in different modes, each displaying different capabilities to meet different challenges or to benefit beings in different ways. In addition to the eight, further forms emerged over time, probably numbering in the thousands. Most of them believed to have been disclosed by Padma Sambhava himself through the medium of treasure texts. I'm not aware of any guru or even any deity within the Tibetan tradition that has as much variety of iconographic representation as Padma Sambhava. Surely there's no figure in the Tibetan imagination more complex, more varied, more consistently associated with crossing boundaries than Padma Samrava, yet also none who inspires more devotion and confidence.
As a final, more anthropological thought, I would like to suggest that Padma Sambhava's popularity might not be unrelated to his complexity and his crossing of boundaries. The anthropologist Charles Ramble has commented on the deep affinity in indigenous Tibetan cultures for chimeras. In Greek mythology, the chimera was a creature with a lion's head, a goat's body, and a serpent's tail. And by extension, the term now indicates any mythical beast formed from the parts of various different animals. In indigenous Tibetan ritual, chimeras figure very prominently as protective deities. For example, in the Black Pillar, a bond text concerned with the overcoming of obstacles, a majority of the hundreds of deities populating its dense mandalas are chimeras of one sort or another. For example, the wolf-hawk crossbreeds in this illustration. Charles Rumble writes as follows. Animals that transgress culturally sanctioned taxonomic boundaries are often the object of special beliefs. Tibetan ritual texts, especially those of the indigenous religion of Bon, sometimes feature semi-divine animals that play an important role as protectors. These creatures, though natural, are perceived as concatenations of the body parts of numerous other natural species and may be understood as various different varieties of chimera. In addition to real animals, the literature also features imaginary creatures that exhibit the physical or behavioral characteristics of several natural species. Each of the animals that provides a component is presented as wielding a specific type of capability, and it is the concentration of these multiple capabilities that gives the chimera, whether real or imaginary, its extraordinary power. Perhaps, then, the unique construction of the mythologized Padmasambhava, Tibet's predestined guru and protector, might be culturally connected to his crossing of so many taxonomic boundaries and his consequent concentration of so many multiple capabilities within a single person. Thank you. And of course, the Asia Society logo is the Leo Griff, which we chose specifically for this conference. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that great paper. Um, are there any questions? Uh, Hi. Oh, sorry. Hold it away a little. I'm just curious um, why there was no mention of Nyangrel Nima Oter and what impact he had on the transformation of his hagiography. Oh, I think I did mention Nyangrel at one point. I mentioned the Zhangling Or I guess why just a mention? And, um, well, I'm actually doing a project on Nyangrel at the moment, and it's nice to look at other things for a change. True, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Though he's very influential, one could say that he almost invented the modern Nima opera that makes Padma Sambhava appear at its head. He lived there in Lobdrak, close in time to Marpa and Kutsadayo and other very influential people in founding their own schools. And uh, it would seem that, you know, early, what we know, what Tibetans like to call Nima, uh, you know, places like early Katok and uh, early family lineage uh, uh, libraries and so on, don't necessarily, and early authors like Nub Sanchi Yeshe don't make a big deal of Padma Sambhava, as I said. It was Nyangral who really put this on the map with his Zanglingma and his comprehensive uh, uh, kind of vision of a Padma Sambhava-centered revelation of Buddhism to Tibet. So you're quite right to raise that question. But really, I just thought my paper would get a little bit too long. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to remark that I've been surprised not to hear anything about the Pan religion, the indig indigenous religion of Tibet. Oh, I, I said quite a lot about the Pan. Well, uh, the influences of, of the animistic aspect of that on tantric Buddhism? Uh, yes, I mentioned the uh, putting of feathers onto the Haruka and the feathers in Padmasambhava's hat and the importation of the rub uh, ritual grammar into Nima ritual. These are all from the uh, pre-Buddhist religion. This is not so much the later Lama version of Bon, but this is really the original Tibetan religion that I think was at work before Bon became organized into monasteries with Lamas, when they still had their priesthoods of the, of the pre-Buddhist type. 
Hi, it's Chelsea from Harvard. Nice to see you again. Um, so I have a question about how you deal with um, Tibetan people's intense belief in Padmasambhava as opposed to your historical research um, and how you kind of uh, can make those two work together or how do you approach that? Uh, well, I think Taranatha, about whom we heard quite a lot yesterday, already tried to look at Padmasambhava more in his aspect of human siddha rather than as a divine emanation. Uh, there are precedents for this in Tibet. And if I'm going to uh, recon try to uh, figure out who a historical Padmasambhava might have been, I don't think this is necessarily very troubling to Tibetans. They've already had Taranatha doing that kind of thing and others. In the current show at the Rubin Museum, they refer to Padmasambhava as the second Buddha. Could you comment on that? Yes, this is uh, exactly how the Nimapa, following Nyangral in particular, have constructed him. Yet yeah, he was very much uh, constructed in that way by, uh, by the Nimapa. And Nyangral, of course, was very instrumental in this. I think the idea is that for Tibet, he's even more important than the historical Buddha. Again, the contrast with Taranatha, who goes back to the Vinaya sources for the historical Buddha in India, that's kind of one pole of, of uh, uh, Buddhist focus. And there's another pole which looks more at uh, the ongoing revelation of spiritual truths from the Dharmakaya, if you like. And so uh, I think that... Uh, this is a polarity that's been inherent in Buddhism all the time. You know, is a scripture something that the historical Buddha uttered, or is it anything that is actually spiritually true that somebody else might utter? And the Nimapas focus more on the latter. And uh, so for them, Padmasambha is kind of a symbol of the living Buddha of today, if you like, the Buddha of now, the Buddha who's still revealing texts, whereas Shakyamuni Buddha was somebody who appeared in India uh, a long time ago and then had his parinirvana, and, and uh, what we're left with is a legacy of his teachings, but he's no longer a kind of tangible living presence that you can reach out and grab in a way you can Padmasambhava in their perception. So they see Padmasambhava as the second Buddha and also as a kind of more important Buddha, and Shakyamuni. We have time for one more question, if there is one. <laughs> okay. Um, in the second row, please. Second row. Okay. Hi, Mok uh, Mokotov. Uh, the, the wings, uh, they did have a specific meaning, though, in the Harukas and the Ishtadevatas that yeah. were adapted in this Nyingma Buddhism. I, I thought they meant they had the uh, concept of, of uh, wisdom and compassion, that you, you needed this, this dual combination in order to fly to awareness or whatever. They're described in great detail in early Sakya texts, in the context of early Purba texts by uh, Drakpa Jolson. Or is it even earlier than that? And uh, they, Drakpa Jolson, I think it's Drakpa Jolson, or maybe an even earlier Sakya master. And uh, that's remarkably close to the non Buddhist Dunhuang texts. You know, you kind of you raise the wing and it emanates protective deities and the right wing is made of this, and the left wing is made of that, and it's very complex. There's, a, there's page after page of uh, iconographic and meaningful discussion of these wings, and th this is what my wife and I studied together, and we think there is some sort of real connection between the pre-Buddhist wings and the later Buddhist descriptions of them. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Meyer, and um, another wonderful paper uh, for this morning.